Uh, our final talk is, is the keynote address by, uh, by Don Paul. Uh, Don's a longtime friend of the, uh, of the department. Uh, and providing the unifying theme here, we're going from smart rocks to intelligent energy. Uh, good afternoon. First, first, I'd like to add uh, my thanks to uh, Lima, Nadia, Jennifer, Earl for putting this together. I think everybody's appreciated uh, the opportunity. And I, I know personally, uh, along with many of you here, appreciated if you think about all the effects that Ted had on you in your life. And um, my remarks, which I think we can, I can do a little bit shorter time because I know we have a hard deadline um, this afternoon. Uh, but this is going, speaking of discontinuities, this is going to be a significant shift in topics. Uh, and I think about uh, Ted, and I know the first topic I was, uh, we could go to the next, next slide, just is, is life lessons. And I call them life lessons because when I thought about it, it's not just the content not just the scientific education I got from Ted. I think uh, in the end it was much broader. And certainly for me personally, now I'm a, probably an end member of the distribution of diversity that his students have shown, but there's a, quite a diverse spread of what people have ended up doing. I know we, uh, we heard the video from John Clarebaugh and those who have not directly involved I may not realize that he is arguably the father of modern exploration seismology and seismic imaging. Now, so he went from doing atmospheric gravity waves to doing seismic imaging. Uh, I think the lesson in that, and a couple things that I, just observations. One is, Ted believed in fundamentals. Problems change, but fundamentals don't. I mean, he was a, uh, an ardent practitioner of that. And you saw it in a lot of the work today. The other thing that, that I think he, Ted demonstrated, although he didn't state it this way, but he was arguably one of the, you know, there's a lot of talk these days about doing multidisciplinary research. A lot of universities push hard on trying to do it. Some succeed more than others. Ted was the original multidisciplinary researcher. He didn't look at it that way. But I think that that, the signs and the importance of being able to not stand pat against traditional boundaries Ted didn't think anything about it. He, he worked on the problems that he was interested in. That was the third lesson. The third lesson was follow the things that interest you and you'll find something that you're, you're really going to be good at. And uh, that was certainly something he told me. The third thing that I think many students will remember is Ted had a basic belief that uh, the amount you learned was in proportion to the difficulty of the problem. So do hard problems and you learn more. Easy problems, you don't learn much. And I think anybody who worked for him remembered that. Remember that. And then the final one, it's one that certainly affected me personally and uh, explains how a, a, a geophysicist could actually end up being a professor of engineering, um, was no fear of doing something just because you don't know anything about it. I know that sounds simple, but, but he did it routinely. And so that was certainly been the case in my career uh, when I went to work for Chevron and ended up doing things I would have never even imagined that I would have done. But I think one of the things I really did learn from Ted was don't be afraid, go learn it. I, I remember we were doing, uh, in my thesis, doing uh, computational fluid dynamics, applied to atmospheric problems. And in those days, you know, of course, machines were extremely limited. And you could barely do the even 2D calculations were challenging. And there was a particular aspect of the, of the simulation that I said was, well, it just runs slow, you know? I mean, it's only so. He said, well, why don't you, why don't you take that piece and program it in assembler? <laughs> assembler? I don't, oh, well, you can learn it. Go do it. <laughs> That is exactly the point. <laughs> if you needed to learn it, go do it. Don't be afraid because you don't know anything about it to begin with. And I, and, and I don't I mean how many times in my life uh, that's been the case. I remember the first, my first real uh, management job, I was sent to be the chief scientist on an exploration ship. 
and I was on the first day, and I said, I know nothing of any value here. And, but I really thought back to what said, don't be afraid, you can learn. Just charge on. And, and so that's kind of been the message and kind of led me to uh, many things. And one of the things that I've been working on a number of years in a broad context is this idea about intelligent energy. So I'll give a few minutes on that. And then uh, I think Rob is up next. So let's go on. We'll try to speed up on this. Um, quick, a quick two-slider on the energy system. An easy way to think about it. <clears throat> and that's there's really four major segments, supply chains, about involved in energy. There's natural resource development. Of course, we heard some about that, certainly on the mineral side. but but in general, certainly oil, gas, coal, uranium, geothermal, all apply in here. Then these, this typically feeds three other major systems, um, electricity, fuel, and distribution, and then of course feedstock for industrial purposes. And these supply chains have some linkages uh, and, and more as, as time is going on. But if I go to the next slide, a couple of key characteristics of these. First off is scale. I mean, one of the challenges when I, when I advise people about energy research or energy technologies, one of the first questions is, can you scale it up? Because if you can't, uh, ultimately it's going to be very limited. Scale is, is enormous. The other is capital intensity, how much money is spent. Uh, just in this segment last year is 1.2 trillion on a worldwide basis, so gigantic numbers. And the next is things live a long time. And this is, this is a very important element when we talk about this, how do you enable intelligence into this infrastructure. There are fields uh, in California in particular, Chevron had a number of them. I'll show you a picture of one in, in a little bit later. It was discovered basically in the 19th century been operating for more than a century. That's a little longer than average, but many assets, and one of the challenges we see today with the breakdown of pipelines and stuff like that, is you have assets that are 50 years old, 70 years old. So the longevity of these assets and the amount of money you put into them, that's a key characteristic of the energy system. And the complexity and the connectivity. A lot of these aspects are connected. What's the other thing? I tell students about if you want to be effective in the energy space, you have to realize that technology and science is one piece, but it's not nearly, it's absolutely necessary, but it's not nearly sufficient. It always involves some business and economics because there is so much money. The other reason is that in the United States in particular, virtually every energy asset is, owned, is privately owned, about 97%. In oil and gas, it's almost 100%. And then, of course, government's in the middle of it. And much to the dismay, I think, of some of my colleagues in industry that don't think about it hard enough, the government's been in the energy business from the beginning, all the way back to certainly the uh, breakup of the Standard Oil Trust, 1911. But increasingly, and perhaps always, but really today, and you can see it, and I'll, when we talk about one other issue, it comes up a little later. People in society are in the middle of this energy issue, too. They're obviously there as consumers, but increasingly they're involved in the development of the infrastructure. Keystone Pipeline, perfect example. <clears throat> okay, so this is kind of a quick picture of what the system is like. Very large, very interconnected. Any one of these entities here involves perhaps uh, in any given operation, hundreds if not thousands of other companies and industries hooked up together. So when you think about how would you add intelligence to such a system, starting to get a grip that this is an enormously complex system. Let's go into the next one. So if you look at the big trends, here's an IT. I'm giving you a clue about what intelligent energy is. But IT and energy, certainly the biggest thing that's happening, probably worldwide, but absolutely in the United States, 
is this, all of a sudden we have a whole new set of resources. And in fact, the US is now dealing with abundance instead of scarcity. Now, many in this room are old enough to remember the days before the oil embargo of 73. But when I talk to my students, they think, <laughs> you know, uh, many of whom uh, were not born until 1990s <clears throat> are saying, well, we've always been short. I said, no. Actually, for most of the history of the United States, the U.S. was by far the big gorilla. By far. In fact, they, uh, I try to do it locally when we take a, a tour to some of the local production facilities in uh, L.A. and Long Beach. Los Angeles was the largest producing area on Earth in 1920. One field, Signal Hill, which actually began the petroleum engineering program at USC, discovered 1921. By 1923, it produced more than 10% of all the world's production. For a long time, basically through World War II, in which the United States supplied 90% of all the petroleum used in the war, the U.S. was literally awash in energy and drove the system. Then it shifted. What's really striking now is at Davos, where they had the, the big economic forum recently, probably seen in the news, that was the talk. The U.S., all of a sudden the U.S. is calling the tune again. And so this is a huge event. The distribution, the diversity, solar, wind, all of this stuff is diversifying the U.S. energy system, which was already the most diverse. But, but increasingly so. And a lot of technology going to that, that's going to have aging infrastructures, efficiency. You hear about it all the time. It's all over MIT. You can see all the little signs. And carbon management, how's that going to play out? And then this is a whole lecture I give in my infrastructure course on automobility. What does it mean? What's automobility? Automobility is not the automobile, although it is. It's What's your view about what autos are? The American definition was that thing in my driveway, I can get in it, I can go as far as I want, any time I want, as long as I have a credit card. Because basically the fuel system is unlimited and everywhere. That was the invention, and that existed because there was unlimited fuel in the United States. This is shifting, and in fact, there's a third of college students now in the United States don't even have driver's licenses. So that's a shift. That's more like Europe and Japan. So what's, how is this all going to go? Meanwhile, of course, China's automobile is now the largest automobile market in the world. It's skyrocketing. They're on their way to double the U.S. consumption of automobiles. So that's an interesting aspect. Then over here, of course, no surprise to people in this room, but Universal sensing. Uh, one of the questions I ask my students is, given the growth rates, you know, whether it's Moore's Law or it's a counterpart in sensing, which is even a steeper exponential, how long before every square meter that you, I mean, basically, every square meter you might occupy is, not under, is under observation? Some cities are already there. London. So, you got that. The other thing that's really changing, and, and this really has practical application when you think about adding intelligence to an energy system, is the consumerization of IT. How many people know what the CES is? Consumer Electronics Show? It's the biggest consumer elect on the planet. I think that it was in Las Vegas, where they all, it's the only place they can hold it at that scale. I think they were approaching 200,000 people last time. But what's happened to IT is it's being driven by consumers. It's not driven by scientists like the old days, not driven by companies like the old days. It's the one billion users, and they drive the system. So that has an effect, too. 
Big data, everybody's got this term. What's the paradigm? Uh, I, my analog for big data is, and I, and I think this is where earth scientists really do come in. Earth scientists, particularly geologists, I know it's a geophysical group, but if you think about geologists, geologists basically do, you don't, it's not a, a reductionist way of determining what's going on. You make observations, you construct a hypothesis, you validate, or you invalidate, or you adjust the hypothesis. This is what the big data paradigm is about. It's not an inverse problem. It can't possibly be an inverse problem when you have petabytes of information, petabytes. It's a question of how do you validate a question. It's more like Google and search, which is, here's my question, is there anything that validates what's connected to it? I think this is happening. Is that reasonable? It goes out, this is Watson and, and Jeopardy. So that is a really interesting area in energy because of the volume of data. I think it's an interesting area in all parts of life because that's, this is so large and the data is so large from all of these things, this is going to start driving the way decisions get made, I believe, broadly. Police departments already use it because that's how de detectives work. Detective work isn't a reductionist activity. It's a clue, a clue, a thread to string those two beads, find the next clue, string them together. So that's an interesting area. Security, of course, and then the whole area about a world populated with autonomous things that run around and measure stuff and do things. I think we're just seeing the beginning. Of, we're seeing the first, um, what I would call practical security robots. This is not quite RoboCop, but, but seriously, things, and we're actually uh, talking with the Los Angeles Police Department about the idea of having robotic sentries. It's a big area, it can't come be everywhere. Have these things running around, making observations. They don't take coffee breaks. They don't go on vacation. And uh, if they're smart enough and you have a smart grid, when they get tired, go over and they plug themselves in for a while and then go back off on their roots. Uh, I think you're going to see, and of course drones, which are everywhere. So all of these things are coming together. The next slide. As you blend the two biggest infrastructures on Earth, energy and information, put them together. Now, in the way I've drawn this, these things kind of sit underneath all of these other, feeding them, connecting to them. Um, intersection, yes, clear. Integration, co-evolution. What's the challenge? revolution of these systems. One, these physical infrastructures last long time. What about IT? That thing's in there cycling away a year, two years, five years, is a, ten years is an eternity for information systems. This is, of course, the class for those system theorists in the audience. Classical, classical element of chaos theory is you have rapid cycles and slow cycles interacting in a nonlinear way, produce instabilities. Um, my personal view is under is how how fa how this infrastructure evolves and how this information infrastructure evolves in the context of these long-lived assets, which, by the way, everybody's Everybody is connected to the energy infrastructure, no matter what you do. Increasingly, everybody's connected to the information infrastructure. How many people have one of these? You ever want to do a really interesting experiment in class? We have a session we do on human behavior and, and technology. Class comes in, I say, OK. Everybody pull it out, pull out one of these iPads, tablets too. Here's the front table. Put them all here. Now you can watch them. They're not going anywhere. Within 10 minutes, I have never seen so much agitation, <laughs> fidgeting, sweating. And I mean sweating. One kid, it got so bad. He, I mean, he really began to tr have tremors. 
I said, okay, okay, experiment's up. I gave him his, his, his iPhone, and he calmed down. Now, this, so I, I, no, I said, anybody has a class, you just do that experiment, and within 15 minutes, you will, you will have a completely distraught group of individuals. Not that they're not using it, it's just that they have it. So let me, so that makes me think <laughs> this is a real issue, <laughs> okay, in the, in the, uh, in the infrastructure. So, so what kind of research drivers might come out of this? Next slide. Okay, one is resource development. I'll mention this one particularly because I, we heard a lot about fractures, understanding fracture networks. I would think that Ted in his prime, what we have now is we have the ability to actually create our own fracture networks and we're doing it. So the idea of actually re-engineering rocks in detail, at scale, and these are cubic kilometers. What an interesting time. So I think the opportunity and the recovery factors from current hydraulic fracturing is so low. In the Marcellus, um, actually the president of the board of trustees of the university is a major independent operator in West Virginia and Pennsylvania. And uh, he says the average recovery factor is 6%, 8%. Every reason to me to think that if you get really good at this and get good at understanding the interactions in those fracture surfaces, you can double that number without any question at all. If you double that number, that means that U.S. natural gas resources get out to 200 years. Huge numbers. Numbers so large that they'll start to shift the rest of the system around. Of course, what's the other thing? To do that economic development, you're going to drill 300,000 wells. <laughs> so the, you are industrializing now part of the country that hadn't been industrialized before. And there's a huge issue about environmental impact. The economic impact is gigantic. Probably two million workers today have jobs because of that. But the societal impact. So these are two, I think, important research areas. And information are clearly going to be part of the way that works. The whole idea of integrated system. I talked about fundamental research. How do you model systems that dynamically have a billion components? Actually, Walmart probably one of the most advanced in supply chain model. They, man they manage a trillion object in real time. Far beyond what most people do. So there are things to that, but how do you really think? You think about inverse theory, that's not probably not going to work. So how do you do that? And so understanding how these really complex nonlinear interconnected systems work, and ones in which you're constantly adding stuff. Cyber physical security. I mean, now you've, it, it's whatever you think your cyber weaknesses are, by making the in, energy infrastructure smart, now everybody has access. So actually, by adding intelligence, you're creating exposures. This is a very active area 